UK exploits its seas for both business and leisure. Fish farms are dotted around our shores, whilst our seaside towns and cities are dependent on the fishing and sailing industries. But what happens once these boats leave our shores and embark upon open waters? While the world is talking about plastic straws and plastic bottles, the marine industries are contributing an estimated 1.6 million tonnes of plastic to our oceans every year. I came to the Isle of Mull in the Scottish Hebrides to find out just how much the marine industries affect our surrounding seas and their wildlife. Mull is an island celebrated for its nature and has thousands of species of seabird, ducks and geese, and even the odd otter or two. But the island's inhabitants have noticed a great problem plaguing their shores and its precious habitats. I met with Darren Morley, who lives on the island and volunteers with beach cleanups and the Coast Guard. He showed me just how great the problem is and where the problem comes from. Okay, so this is the section of beach that we cleaned uh, just, this, just a couple of months ago. Yeah. And you can see the amount of small bits of plastic and it's debris that's on the beach. Bits of packing strap, which are, with us as a name on, are untraceable. That's uh, out of a box that separates the langoustines or the squatties, as they call, might be called locally. And that is the plastic wrapping that's come right. off a creel pop. That would have been a piece of rope once. Yeah. And now that's turned into a lot of little fibres. That might have landed here as a big piece of rope and is now broken down with the wave action into lots and lots of little fibres and eventually that will break down even further yeah. until it becomes the microplastics that we all fear. So that's unfortunately what we're up against. Over one year, thousands of fragments from rope, bait boxes, lobster pots and fish crates had washed up on that beach, all from marine industries. Darren took me to meet Marie, who organises beach cleans, to show me the problem on an even larger scale. Yeah, we've got our usual plastic bottles, which you get all over the country, but what we find here is more fishing-related things. Floats like this, this is typical. That would be attached to a line of creels, maybe. You often find them with used oil in, and perhaps a fisher, fishing boat has done an oil change for the engine, and they've yeah. thrown that over the side. We don't know, we're speculating, but... There's so many of those that get washed off, it makes you suspicious. Pull to the brim. If that splits open and you see, that's a huge slick across yeah. the surface. Yeah. Because it'll spread itself out into a huge area. Yeah. It'll just sit as a very thin film on the top of the water. And anything that comes into contact with it is in big trouble. So diving birds, birds that are just sat on the water. That's tough because, I mean, I can barely lift that. That's really yeah. heavy. So for people like you that are trying to do something and clear this up, as you say, it was half an hour for us to get here. That's a job there for somebody, an hour's work. The only way of getting this stuff out is by a little boat that can manage to get in there when conditions are calm. Yeah. Yeah, there's not enough people that talking about fishing-related plastic litter at the moment. And I'd love to solve the problem at source rather than carry on picking it up. Yeah. Um, because we're only picking up a fraction of it. Imagine how much is out there, or at the bottom of the sea. What can be done to clear this plastic pollution in our seas? There is a team of divers on the case, Ghost Fishing UK, who are using their expertise to reduce the impact we are having beneath water. Abandoned, lost or discarded fishing gear is a huge problem in our oceans. The UN estimates that 600,000 tonnes of fishing gear is left in the ocean each year, which is having a devastating impact on marine wildlife and stunting conservation efforts. In order to remove it, the only way is up. Lost fishing gear kills and maims marine life in one of two ways, through either ingestion or by continuing to fish, entangling, starving, or asphyxiating its catch. This is a phenomenon called ghost fishing. Once below water, the Ghost Fishing UK divers work calmly yet fervently to remove as much gill net as possible before their air runs out. The line is covered in tangled spider crabs fighting for their freedom. 
On the surface, the remaining team members look out for the float bags, which lift the fishing gear waist and crabs to the surface. We've got two live ones. It's all hands on deck now for the detangling and data collecting, after which time these lucky crabs can be freed. Bag upon bag full with plastic line, spider crabs, mollusks and sea sponges is brought to the surface as the divers continue to work tirelessly below. Once collected, the materials will then be recycled, becoming perhaps socks, carpet tiles or even art. It's tough work detangling these enormous and leggy spider crabs from such fiddly line, but there is a real sense of achievement in it. Christine Grosart, Ghost Fishing UK secretary and diver, spoke to me about the importance of what they do. Over the last three years that Ghost Fishing UK have been operating, um, we've basically started from scratch in terms of data gathering. Um, nobody else is collating data in the way that we do. Shooting video footage and photographs um, of this stuff actually being caught and being killed in the sea um, it has a much bigger impact on, on public awareness, I think. If people can't see this, they don't care. You can't care about something that you can't see. Programs like, you know, Blue Planet and things like that are very, very visual and have really caught the public's imagination. And there's a big drive at the moment about ocean plastics. It's a hot topic right now. Um, and there's never been a better time for us to be doing this kind of activity, I think. In 2009, a UN report found that most ghost fishing gear is not intentionally discarded. Does that mean that the industry can wash their hands of the responsibility? I travelled to Orkney, off the north coast of Scotland, to meet with an expert in fishing sustainability. If people want to eat fish, uh, if they want to eat shellfish, they've got to be aware of the process uh, that's involved in getting that uh, to their plates. The big retailers like Marks and Spencer and other big supermarkets really require all of their seafood products to be demonstrably from sustainable sources. The Orkney Sustainable Fisheries can work with fishermen to ensure that their sustainable practice is recognised and they're rewarded for that. Fishermen will do their utmost not to lose very valuable gear. And it's it's eye-watering how much a, a trawl costs. You know, sometimes for safety reasons, if they're snagged on something, there, there, there can be no option but to cut the gear free. The sea is a dangerous place and it's a wild place. So it's a very different issue to the more deliberate littering of the sea. Most fishermen would like the industry to be seen in a very good light uh, and don't want to be seen as littering the seabed. The Scottish islands are littered with beautiful reworkings of ghost fishing gear. Originally from England and now living on Orkney, Mark Cook, otherwise known as Afraid Not, works in partnership with Ghost Fishing UK, taking off their hands the rope which they bring to the surface. Five years ago I moved up to Orkney and um, I was out walking on the beach, came across this ghost fishing gear. I didn't know that's what it was at the time. And I thought, oh great, I'll have that. Sat down on the beach, untangled it and uh, took it home and then um, tangled it back up to my first doormat. So then I realised how much of this stuff there was actually being washed up on the shore. Not in the last four years have I bought a new piece of rope. This is the place I should be. I feel part of it and I feel part of helping to keep it precious. Recycling projects and cleanup operations are cropping up all over the world, not just in the UK but we still have such a long way to go in rectifying what damage mankind has already done to the oceans and to the marine life, and in preventing a future generation's worth of tragedy. But from beach cleans, to lobbying for harbour recycling points, to campaigning for biodegradable equipment, there is something that everyone can do. Our planet is covered with 70% water, and the oceans provide us with food and oxygen. Our future depends on its future.